Welcome to Bible Study for Progressives, a show where moderates, liberals, and leftists of all faiths and ideologies come together to discuss scripture, spirituality, and politics. We engage scripture in its historical context, plumb its depths for wisdom and guidance, and apply its lessons to current events and social issues. Whether you're a liberal evangelical, a new age spiritualist, a social justice activist, or a postmodern theologian, there's something in this show for you. Come, be energized in spirit and mind to understand the word and what it means to be a spiritual person in today's world. Welcome to Bible Study, Parody, and Subversion in Matthew's Gospel. Simka Bunin of Peshika, a 19th century Jewish leader in Poland, used to say that everybody has two pockets. Out of one, they can draw a paper which says, I am but dust and ashes. Out of the other, they can draw another paper which says, For me, the universe was made. Through this teaching, Rabbi Bunim gave his students an incredibly powerful tool one that can reshape the very foundation of human existence. That tool is the power of interpretation. How we interpret the world makes a world of difference. One way to understand the Gospel of Matthew is that it tells the story of an ancient Galilean rabbi who struggles to help his people reinterpret the world. He tells his peasant followers that they, not the educated scribes of the upper classes, but they, the unclean masses, the people of the dirt. They are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. He gives them authority that is often claimed by upper class specialists, authority to heal and cast out demons, to reverse the effects of the Roman Empire's domination and spiritual colonization. A major part of this work involves reinterpreting Israel's scriptures to show his followers how they, together as a movement for a new society, are fulfilling the visions of the prophets. Jesus interprets the national canon of literature for them in a way that changes the very foundation of their world, setting them on a course for liberation. I will make the case in this episode that in chapter 11 of Matthew, we get even more evidence that Matthew intends his readers not merely to understand hidden meanings and secrets already present in a deeper reality, but to actually change reality through interpretation. The secret that is being revealed is that they have the power to change the world by enacting a new social order, and that to do so, They need to be able to see it coming, to see that social order coming into their world. The new society, the kingdom of heaven, is a future reality breaking into the present. And only those who put it into practice can hear and see it and enter into it. My name is Bert Newton, and this is episode 26 of Bible Study, Parody and Subversion in Matthew's Gospel. Let's begin with the first three verses of chapter 11. Now, when Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, 
He went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Now, when we Christians read this text, the way we tend to understand it is that John, after having proclaimed Jesus as the one, is now having doubts that Jesus really is the one. So this is merely about John's doubts. Well, it is that, but it is also much more than that. John's question here is not merely a question about one particular hope for a Messiah, but a question about whether Jesus, rather than the other Messiahs, is the one. You see, the first century was a time of many would-be Jewish messiahs or liberators. There was Judas the Galilean, who led a revolt in Galilee when Jesus was a child. There was Thutis, roughly a contemporary of Jesus, who led a force of 400 to the Jordan River, claiming that he would part the river like Joshua had and would lead the people into the land as Joshua did to reconquer it. There was a guy referred to as the Egyptian, probably a Jew from the diaspora in Egypt, who led a force of 4,000, according to the book of Acts, or 30,000, according to Josephus, onto the Mount of Olives in an attempt to launch from there a liberation of Jerusalem. And then there were the leaders of the great Jewish revolt of 66, John of Geshala, Simon bar Giora, and Menahem, who all vied for the title of Messiah during that uprising. The author of Matthew would have known of all of them, and he references all of these uprisings in his gospel. And Messiah mania was still not over at the time of the writing of the gospel of Matthew. In the year 132, 40 or 50 years after the writing of Matthew, another would-be Messiah, Simon bar Kokhba, or Simon son of a star, would attempt yet another liberation. All of these uprisings attempted a military liberation. And when any of these messiahs actually obtained power, and some of them did, they all ruled by use of brutal force, eliminating all potential threats, even former close friends, and fighting with each other. And all of them were defeated by Rome. So a lot rides on this question. Is the messiah a warrior? who will set up another kingdom and rule by force? Or is the Messiah someone like Jesus? What will the Messiah be like? That is a central theme in this story. And along with that question is one that goes with it. What is God like? Is God a harsh king who rules by force? Does God crush his enemies? Whatever God's Messiah is like says a lot about what God is like. So John's question seems simple, but on it rides the very image of God, the image that, according to Genesis 1, is imprinted in the hearts of humankind. Is he the one, or should we expect another? John has his doubts, perhaps because Jesus is not smiting his enemies. He hasn't raised an army. John hadn't raised an army either, but now that he's in jail awaiting his execution, Maybe he's thinking that Jesus should raise an army, maybe one that could come to his rescue. So John asks, is he the one, or should we expect another? John isn't sure anymore. John was a radical visionary, but in jail, he seems to be losing his vision. He doesn't see so clearly anymore. The future looks blurry now. And so Jesus answers John's question. Let's begin with just verse 4. Jesus answered, Go and tell John what you hear and see. Jesus tells them to report what they hear and see. What people hear and see constitutes a major theme in this story because not everyone hears and sees the same thing. People can look at the same events and see different things. In other words, hearing and seeing is all about interpretation, and interpretation can change the most foundational elements of our world. 
So Jesus continues in verses 5 to 6, describing what they have seen and heard. Jesus says, The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Now, to the modern reader, it may seem that Jesus is pointing to his miracles of healing as proof that he is the Messiah. But Jesus is doing much more than that. Jesus is interpreting the work of his movement, and he is interpreting it in a very specific way to help John see and hear clearly again. Jesus here uses imagery familiar to the original audience that signaled liberation from oppression, especially foreign oppression. The imagery that Jesus uses is taken from Isaiah. It is all imagery that describes in its original context in Isaiah the liberation of Israel from a foreign oppressor. For example, describing the glorious days when the exiles return from Babylon, Isaiah sings, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. Isaiah 35, 5-6 This healing language is about liberation from a foreign empire. John sits in prison, awaiting his execution by a king appointed by Rome. He wants to know if the liberation of his people has finally arrived. Jesus sends a message back that his campaign of healing fulfills the visions of the prophets. The liberation has begun. Jesus then turns and speaks to the crowds about what this liberation looks like and how it is based on a different kind of wisdom, a different way of seeing and hearing, a different way of understanding the world, one that changes even the very image of God, the image that is imprinted on the hearts of humankind. Let's read the next two verses, verses 7 and 8. As they went away... Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. A reed shaken by the wind, soft robes, and royal palaces. These are not just idle images. Jesus is comparing John to Herod. Herod, who has imprisoned John. A reed was the symbol for Herod, a symbol that was printed on coins that he circulated in Galilee. But here Jesus talks of a reed blown about by the wind. We will see later that Matthew portrays Herod as weak, soft, and corrupt. So the soft robes and royal palaces also contrast Herod's weakness, wealth, and corruption with John who, as we saw in chapter 3, wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Herod may have imprisoned John and John may be having his doubts, but Jesus rhetorically interprets John to be the greater and incorruptible one. Let's continue with the next two verses, 9 and 10. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Jesus here quotes Exodus 23.20, a passage about the Exodus liberation from the Egyptian empire. Exodus 23.20 reads, See, I am sending out my messenger ahead of you. Jesus reinterprets the text and identifies John as the messenger, for John is the one who came before him and started the current liberation that Jesus is now leading, a new exodus from oppression under the Roman Empire. The original text from Exodus goes on to talk about the military conquest of Canaan. The current campaign 
by John and Jesus is, in contrast, a nonviolent campaign. But it will, like the original conquest of the land, culminate in Jerusalem. So the whole idea of conquest is reinterpreted. Jesus continues in verses 11 to 15. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and violent men attack it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. These verses are full of reinterpretation. First of all, Jesus reinterprets John for the crowds. He's not the defeated man losing his faith in prison, but rather the greatest of the prophets. But then Jesus quickly reminds his audience that in the new society, the kingdom of heaven, the greatest person is the least, and the least is the greatest. Jesus then speaks of the movement suffering violence. From the days of John, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. Now, if the kingdom of heaven is just an otherworldly reality or something only in the future, then it could not suffer violence. But the kingdom of heaven is the new society already present in those who put it into practice. It is a new social order already breaking into this world, a future reality breaking into the present. And it suffers from violent acts against it, as did the prophets who came before it. The movement for a new society is not a military campaign that inflicts violence, as the campaigns of Joshua and David, both of whom boasted of the violence that they inflicted. Rather, this campaign absorbs the violence and nevertheless overcomes it. Its path to victory is through the cross. Then Jesus says, If you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. If you can accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. In other words, this is Jesus actively, consciously reinterpreting the tradition, reinterpreting the prophetic tradition. He turns John into Elijah. Elijah was a thorn in the side of the monarchy in his day. In the same way, John has been a thorn in the side of the monarchy, the Herodian monarchy. John has, in a sense, taken up the role of Elijah. And so Matthew tells us that this whole story is a story of active interpretation or reinterpretation. How you hear, how you understand makes all the difference. How you hear, how you understand even changes things. Do you understand that John is now Elijah? Do you understand that the least is now the greatest? Do you understand that a prophet dressed in camel's hair and eating locusts and wild honey who sits in prison will prove to be greater than a king wearing fine robes and living in a palace? Do you understand that the way to liberation is not by violence, but through an aggressive campaign of nonviolence? Do you understand the way of the cross? Do you see where we are going? Do you have ears to hear? Matthew's Jesus calls people not only to see and hear more deeply, but to see and hear in a way that changes things to understand in a way that reinterprets the texts and changes the future. This whole story is about an alternative type of wisdom which interprets or reinterprets the world in a way that changes it. Do we understand? Can we see like prophets? Will we join Jesus in his reinterpretation of the world? These questions will permeate each passage as we continue through this parable that is the story of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel.
the story in Matthew is revealed in chapter 11 to be one of active reinterpretation of Israel's texts, as well as reinterpretation of the whole world. Jesus reinterprets the world for his followers, including their literary canon, to give them the power to change the future. The reason that chapter 11 strikes me as being such a revealing moment in the story is because up until that point, only the narrator has been citing specific passages from the prophets or Israel's other sacred literature to show how Jesus fulfills them. Jesus has been recognized as son of God by the devil and some demons. John the baptizer gave him an introduction with a lot of vivid imagery, but no specific quote from the prophets or any other text. And a couple of blind men call him son of David which will prove to be inaccurate, as we will see later in the story. But no character in the story has applied a specific text from Israel's canon of literature to Jesus to show that he fulfills it. Only the narrator has done that. And perhaps more to the point, Jesus has said that he came to fulfill the prophets and the law, but has not yet himself, as a character in the story, named one of those texts clearly as one that he is fulfilling. It's not that Jesus hasn't been quoting the Hebrew Bible. He has. He has been acting out the ancient texts, reenacting Israel's sacred stories, but he has not taken a specific text and stated that he is fulfilling it. He hasn't given his followers much in the way of details. The narrator has been giving us, the audience of the story, details about how he fulfills the ancient text, but Jesus in the story has not been doing that for his followers in the story, at least not clearly. The closest he has come, I think, is in chapter 10, when he riffed off of Micah 7, 6. I didn't cover it in that episode, but he did that when he was talking about the way his revolution will rip apart households. He said, For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. That sounds a lot like Micah 7, 6, but the way that he uses it is more cryptic and not really as a fulfillment text. Micah 7, 6 is more about the moral breakdown of Israelite society, whereas Jesus riffs off of it ironically showing how what dominant society fears in terms of moral breakdown will be exactly what his movement and its revolution do. It is what they will do to dominant society. It's a very subversive and ironic use of the Micah text. So not exactly fulfillment. In fact, it's sort of the opposite. Chapter 11 is the first time that Jesus, rather than the narrator, it's the first time that Jesus as a character in the story overtly states that he and his movement are fulfilling specific ancient texts. It's the first time that he gives his followers this sort of detail. First, he quotes language from Isaiah about healing and bringing good news to the poor, language that in Isaiah signals liberation from foreign empires and the dawning of a society of justice. He uses this language to describe the work of his movement, Then he goes on to actually say that John the baptizer is Elijah. For the first time, a human character in the story, the main character in the story, rather than the narrator, says, Hey people, we're fulfilling the visions of the prophets. In fact, John, he's Elijah. It would have been really cool if he had started naming other roles for other people in the movement but papyrus space was limited, so we only get John's role. And he prefaces his statement about John by saying, if you can accept it. In other words, you've got a choice. You can see it this way or not. You've got a choice to make. Whereas previously the narrator has been interpreting the story as fulfillment, now the characters in the story become aware of it. They find out that Jesus has been leading them very intentionally to fulfill the visions of the prophets. He's telling them that this isn't something that's going to happen without them knowing about it. They aren't passive participants in God's plan. 
Jesus is telling them that they are active participants. They must make a choice to fulfill the visions of liberation. They must choose to participate and bring about the new society. God is depending on them. This ain't going to happen without them. They must wake up, begin to see and hear, and begin to put this new thing into practice. Only then will the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This has been Bible Study for Progressives. If you enjoyed the program, please subscribe to our podcast or put us in your favorites and write a five-star review. Tell your friends about us and share us on social media. Follow us on Facebook and click the donate button at modernlectionaries.blogspot.com. Your support will help us reach more people, produce more and better shows, and cover the cost of production. Feel free to send me a note or comment on the show. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, this is Rich Procida. Thank you for listening.